Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar. I'm Camille Moore with Connect, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in to Hot Technologies 2018 with Jim Spellows. Before we get started, there are just a few housekeeping notes on the platform. You can type in your questions for Jim in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen or via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'd love for this to be an interactive session, so please send in questions throughout the webinar. We'll be using ScreenShare during this presentation, so if you would like to enlarge your slide panel, there is a Maximize button um, in, the type, in the top right corner of the box. A recorded version of this session will be available on demand on our websites where you can find additional on-demand webinars for any of you needing last-minute credit hours before CMP testing. Yes, you are able to watch our sessions on demand and still receive credit. For everyone joining us live today, the CMP credit is pending approval from the EIC. Once the credit is approved, we will email you your certificate of attendance. For any of you future viewers watching this session on demand and not live, please email me directly at cmore at connecttravel.com to receive your certificate. I'll share more information about our upcoming webinars at the end of the program, but let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank Providence Warwick for sponsoring today's session. They have provided a video to share about their destination. Here is Providence, Rhode Island. summer here in Rhode Island, land of perfect sun, sand, and surf. does Providence look? Thank you again, Providence Warwick. Before I introduce Jim, I want to introduce my coworker, Kristen Francis, our Senior Director of Sales, who is here to talk about a few of our upcoming events. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Camille. So just want to share with you um, some information about our largest event that's coming up, our signature event, Connect Marketplace. Registration is currently open. Um, we are encouraging everyone to secure their registration as soon as possible. Um, we do have first come first serve with all of our hotels, so once you apply and are approved, you'll be able to proceed with booking your hotel arrangements, so strongly encourage you to register as soon as possible. If you have any questions, um, Camille is going to uh, add my email address here. Please do not hesitate to contact me. It's going to be a very exciting event. We're expecting somewhere around 1,300 meeting professionals in attendance and a total attendance overall between our supplier representatives as well as uh, planners somewhere around 4,000 attendees. So very excited about that and hope to see you there. Um, definitely encourage you to attend. Thank you, Kristen. Now without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jim Spellows. Jim Spellows is the president of Meeting You, a company specializing in helping people become more productive and comfortable with technology. Jim is certified as a Microsoft Office Specialist. He delivers over 150 seminars annually on how to use technology more efficiently. 
Jim is an adjunct faculty member at New York University, teaching in the School of Professional and Continuing Studies since 1990. He has been honored with both its award for teaching excellence and its outstanding service award. Jim was also named one of the hospitality industry's trendsetters in 2015 for his technology education. In 2014, Jim joined the board of directors for Rock and Wrap It Up, an anti-poverty, anti-hunger think tank which supports over 43,000 agencies in North America. Jim co-created for them their Whole Earth Calculator app, which helps organizations identify the quantity of food donated and carbon footprint reduced by an organization helping to recover excess food from events. Jim is also an accomplished musician and songwriter, playing guitar, keyboard, and singing for the New York City rock band Contraband. They released their first CD, Welcome to the Neighborhood, in late 2008, and is per perpetually in the recording studio working on their next project. Jim, welcome. Thank you for sharing with us today. Camille, thanks so much, and welcome, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are. A couple things to note. Number one, we're going to play and talk a lot about technology today, which means your phones which are probably right next to you. Keep them on. You'll be using them. Do put them on silent or stun to make sure that the phone call doesn't disrupt what we're going to do. And actually, we're going to start with a poll because I want to find out what you think technology means to our industry. The question is straightforward. What word best describes technology as it applies to our industry? And so here are some answers for you. Let's talk about the poll. Get this live. Get this going. So I want you to text. To 22333. That's two twos, three threes. And the message will be the six digit number that applies to the word that works. So if you think technology in our industry is amazing, if that's the word you want to give, 242990 will be the text number, the text message you should put in there. Uh, if it is annoying, uh, 243836. If you think the word of the day regarding technology and our industry is disruptive, 243859. And if you think the word is never ending, yeah, yeah, I know it's two words. Work with me on that one. 243860. So, again, what we're going to do here is get this poll out. I see a couple of responses coming in. You'll see the results in a second. We're using polleverywhere.com. And if you've been in any of my sessions for the past uh, seven, eight years, great way to really incorporate low tech texting into the conversation, into the, the engagement of the session. I have a few results right now, so what we're going to do is take a look at them, and we'll use that as a jumping off point for the conversation today. Um, and essentially, it goes from amazing to never ending, and I think that's pretty fair. What, what hasn't been posted yet, and I think it's interesting, is the word disruptive. Because quite frankly, if I was going to answer that question, I might, I might check all the boxes. But I think disruptive might be the one that really plays into what we're doing because technology is so changing what we do in our industry. In fact, it's changing what we do in every industry. But perhaps more so here because it's moving so fast, we have to respond to our attendees, our customers, our constituents, and we have to stay up with all this. That disruption makes it really difficult for us as planners and suppliers to really be able to know the right discussion the right technology at the right time. In fact, what we tend to do is we tend to put a word, good or bad, and assign that to technology. And I've always believed that's not the right approach to talk about technology that way because they're just tools. They're tools that can be used for good. They're tools that can be used for, for not so good. But quite frankly, we do have to define technology on some sort of scale. So let's use the old way cool, way creepy scale. And I think when we're talking about a lot of technologies and how you think stuff is amazing, way cool is the way it goes. But we'll, we'll see that creep into the red zone as we move the conversation forward. I've got one of the polls uh, before we really move on. So I want to find out the technology that you've been utilizing for your business. And let's look at it in the past year, 2017, even maybe into early 2018. Again, same sort of approach. The tech will be a, the poll will be 22333. But this time, it's going to be an open-ended one. So I want you to put in there whichever terms, whatever words apply. So 22333 is the text message, or I should say the text number. The message, 141041, followed by a space, and followed by whatever that particular word or phrase is. So digital and CE both come up right away into the conversation. 
So as you see, you'll post this up here. We'll take a look at where you are in the technology. For a lot of people, when we do this poll, that impact tends to be on a very basic level. For some folks, it might be in the social media area. Um, hopefully, some folks will be using some of the technology we're going to be pushing forward today as what really is the 2018 technology conversation. You know, so we have a couple that are up here. We'll come back to this poll in a minute. We'll take a look at where people are. But for right now, as you're responding to that, let's really move forward with defining tech in two different ways, old school, new school. And when we talk old school hot technologies, or as the acronym goes, oh, shoot, I can't say that. Um, it really is the stuff that you need to be using, but you shouldn't really be focusing a lot of your time on. For example, conference apps. Now, some of you are going to have a cow saying, well, we have to focus a lot of time on the conference app, and I, and I get it. But quite frankly, this should be a conversation that is enriching what you already have rather than trying to figure out which app to use for the conference this year, what service. What your conference app conversation should be like right now is how do you incorporate some of the newer technology, technologies in there so we can continually engage our attendees properly. So to me, the conference app conversation is an old school conversation, yet still one that's very germane. Another old school conversation are traditional websites. And, and I say this all the time. Uh, if, if you're spending a lot of time and a lot of money updating a traditional website, a desktop, laptop website, I really do think you're missing the whole idea because more and more people are using mobile and mobile only, not only mobile first, but mobile only as their connection of point for any information that they're trying to gather. And I've seen organizations spend ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on a new website with slick little uh, visuals there. Quite frankly, your website's about real-time content to be able to sell or provide the services that you need. Think mobile first always. And we're going to talk more about the mobile approach in a few seconds. Lastly, in the old school, you know, quite frankly, social media. I mean, Facebook, how 2012 of a conversation, although thanks to Cambridge Analytica and what's happened, that clearly has a new life conversation for us these days. But social media shouldn't be which of these tools should we be using. It's how do we encourage all the tools to be used to make sure they connect with our customers and our clients most effectively. So this is old school. So if that's old school, really the game is about change. And it's about the speed of the change that's taking place in technology. So let's take a quick stroll back. Got some images to look at as to what tech looked like over the years. We'll make this pretty quick. But in the 80s, hot tech is a lot different than what we see right now. In fact, we can put onto the screen PCs, Macs, fax machines. Matter of fact, for some of us, the fax machine was the real wow of all of those in the early, mid-80s. I mean, mail letters over the phone. How cool was that? Talk about how things have changed so quickly. And each decade, when new technology pushes its way through, some technology just pulls away. In the 80s, well, it wasn't a lot of technology that we were using in R or any industry, but dedicated word processors clearly had the, well, they were the precursor to the computer right there. I, I remember getting a PC on my desk early on in the 80s and having no idea what do you do about it. I mean, what do I do with this? My boss said, learn it. it it's your future. And the uh, man was right, no question about that. So as we move into the 90s, well, the conversation clearly is about the Internet. Netscape Navigator, browsers coming on board, all this amazing information that's out there. I, you know, if you of a certain age, you remember before we had registration online, stuff that people were calling in or maybe using the fax machine to register. Google takes hold in the late 90s. And completely transforms how business is done across everywhere. Uh, Palm Pilots, these old school phones that were out there were really state of the art. And, and Amazon. So we're talking about a decade of huge, huge change. Now, what went, well, the typewriter went, and quite frankly, what also went at that point, well, at least in theory, was the fax machine. Understand, change moves really rapidly, so sometimes stuff doesn't even last a decade. The aughts, which we lived through for 10 years and still couldn't find a better name than aughts to give it, but really it's, it's two words. It's social and it's mobile. Social media and smartphones. If we look back on last decade, that really is what the game changers were, and my goodness, they are huge game changers indeed. In fact, it started pushing some old school stuff out 
from the flip phones that we had to maybe even the fax machines. And they seem, keep, seem to keep getting second lives, don't they? But social and mobile completely reiterated and changed how we do our events. Now, when we think about this decade, and we're almost through with it, what might be those tools that we're going to look at? Well, I clearly think virtual reality is going to be one of them, although we still haven't hit that sweet spot with VR. We're going to talk more about that today. Autonomous vehicles, another subject for conversation that we're going to have today, is clearly changing the game, and maybe some of you might even be considering using those at your events in the next few years. A lot of you might not be thinking that, but we'll, we'll find out. And uh, augmented reality, but in particular, Google Glass, which came in with a bang, but quite frankly, nobody liked it. Why? Well, it seemed really prying. It seemed that it was very much invasive. And people who wore it were kind of arrogant about it. It was expensive. And, and really what lost this decade was Google Glass as well, which shows you how fast technology can come and go. Uh, the fax machine also obviously is trying to go away this decade, although talk to my doctor, he's still using it. So the real question is, where's it going? Where are we going with the technology? Well, maybe a couple of words you need to know about for the next decade include the blockchain. Now, we're not going to spend time here, but let's get a quick definition. The blockchain is a ledger. It's an online tool that allows information to be shared securely. Now, what you really have heard about, you might not have heard the word blockchain, but you might have heard Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And those online currencies use the blockchain as the backbone. But while cryptocurrency is clearly a conversation that might never make it to prime time and might, the blockchain, the ability to support this in a secure way is something you're going to need to be aware of as you will need to be aware of for 5G, high-speed cellular. Um, some people think that once, once 5G hits, and it's being tested in trials this year, that it might replace the need for Wi-Fi because the speed is going to be so good. Clearly, we'll see about that down the road. But next decade, two terms early on you should be paying attention to. So what goes next decade? I think anyone using a traditional computer, desktop computers especially, they, they've run their course. It's all mobile, right? Now, on a little bit more of a pushy scale, what about your driver's license? We talked about autonomous cars this decade coming in. Is next decade the last decade we'll actually have driver's licenses? I know a lot of you are going to resist that, but it's a conversation we need to have at some point. And, of course, the fax machine will finally go next decade. So we got this all covered. So the question now with hot technologies is what's on your radar? What are you looking at? What do you need to be looking at? And so let's put a few terms on the table for you. Let's talk about what some people will call mixed reality. We can segment that into augmented and virtual. And as we move forward with this session, we're going to define both and give you a little bit of an idea of how both can work. We're going to talk about, and what should be on our radar, wearables and how that's going to change the game. You know, your phone that you have um, and we pull out and, and use all the time, we're still going to have it in five years, but maybe, just maybe, it's never going to come out of our pockets. Maybe it's always going to be in our pocketbook or our briefcase and it will be connected to all the different devices, including the wearables that we'll be using. Um, the blockchain, clearly a word that should be on your radar, if for no other reason than to be able to have that conversation with your boss when he or she says something like, Do we ever, can we ever use the blockchain for our events? And the answer is, we probably will down the road, but not ready for it right now. Bot, chatbot. Here's a conversation whose time for our industry has come, and we need to be paying attention to the influence of artificial intelligence and chatbots on the conversation that we're having with our customers. Now, with all this said, we're all over the place. And I know I hate to bring you back to, you know, eighth, ninth grade math, but you remember the old bell curves you used to see, like the one on the screen? Well, the adoption of technology sort of fits that same standard. On the far left, we have the innovators, the, you know, the, the Steve Jobs and people like that, Bill Gates, who really are pushing the envelope forward. Then we have a small percentage of early adopters. I'm, I'm probably in that Corbin Ball, who you probably know is in that area too. Lots of cool people in our industry really want to be the first to test things out. But the majority of the people that you're working with, your customers, your clients, your team, are fall into that early, late majority category. And that's over two-thirds of the people who are out there. And then at the very end of that scale, are the people who are still saying, nah, I'm not going to get a smartphone. My flip phone's the best one in the world. Those are the laggards. So 
the question simple. Where should your events be? Give you a minute to think about that. But really, you don't want to be that far over to the right. Because if you're too far over in that laggard territory, well, you're going to be classified as a, as a legacy event. What I'm going to suggest is your event should probably be somewhere in between, near, around that early adopter, early majority approach. Why? Well, it, it's straight customer 101. If we look at the early majority segment, that already is 50% of our customers, including the early adopters and the innovators. And quite frankly, I don't want to be any place or not be any place that half of my customers already are. So if we know that we want to be in that stage where we're looking at capturing at least half of our customers, the next question is kind of clear, is, well, how do we define these five areas? And we can look at the innovator, early adopter, early majority, late majority, and laggard. And we can put a single word that helps you apply and remember what to do about them. So for innovative technology, and in the next slide we're going to talk about what we think those, those are, it's really a, a level of awareness. We don't need to be doing anything, but that's where that name first comes on our radar. Next up, the early adopters. That's your consideration. That's where you're going, you know, we're talking about doing this. Maybe conference apps in 2010, 2011, 2012, they were in the consideration stage because you were talking about it, but you weren't sure which company to go with, you didn't know how you were going to use it, and the adoption was slow, still, you want to be having that conversation before 2017, 2018. For the early majority, that's implementation. The time that we, that the technology gets into half the audience, you shouldn't be thinking about it anymore. You should be doing it, and it should be done, because if you're in the late majority, then you're scrambling. And, well, if you're in the laggards, I'll, um, since I'm a New Yorker, I'll use a, a New York word to define this. The word there is forget about it because you're already too late on the conversation. But the bottom line is where you want to be, that early adopter, early majority, is that consideration implementation stage. So with that said, how late are we? So we'll take a look at all of these tools. And we'll think about these before we showcase everything. So the first technology we'll talk about, artificial intelligence, where do you think it fits on that scale? You know, a lot of people will say it's in the innovator scale. I'm sure nobody's going to say it's in the laggard scale, but from my perspective, that's already in the early majority scale. And again, as we move this forward, this conversation that we're going to have today, we're going to have to define why I think those things are there. Now, clearly, some of you can say, well, I still think it's a little bit more in the early adopter scale. And you know what? It could be right. You know, there's no definitive place, but it's already in in our homes every day. Augmented reality, same thing there. I know some of you are always saying, how can I use that for my events? We'll, we'll talk about a few ways, but I also always want you looking at consumers outside of our industry to get a sense of where we need to be inside of this industry because it's, it's our customers who are going to tell us which technologies we need to be paying attention to. Blockchain is far too early for the conversation. That's why it lands in the innovator scale. The bots, the chat bots, they're in early adopters, but you know what? Some people would make an argument right here saying, that's early majority at this point. So implementation, consideration. It's right where that conversation should be about your events. Your mobile website, the fact that you're thinking about you making your website mobile right now, really late majority. Might even be where social media resides, which is in the laggards part of the conversation. What about VR? Yeah, I'm still not sure. It's somewhere in that scale of where we should be, early adopter, early majority. And the wearables, well, probably the same. I put it in early majority. I could be convinced early adopter. But you know what? Most of the technologies, these hot technologies, AI, AR, VR, are all at a point of implementation for ourselves, not just consideration. So we see this technology around how do we know and detect? What are the, what are the signs that we're getting? Well, I'll give you three of them. And one's real simple. Matter of fact, all three are simple. One is buzz. When we hear the conversations, when we go to Starbucks or in the office, we hear people talking about a technology. They're mentioning VR, and they're saying they just got an Oculus Rift, or they went to a place and experienced it. That has to be a huge telltale sign that we need to be looking at this technology for what we're doing in our events. Sometimes you have to figure out how we're going to do it, but clearly we have to be in that process. The second thing you need to be aware of is advertisements, television advertisements or 
simply advertisements on YouTube or other video channels. I always say that advertisements are the best, best way for us to understand which technology is going to hit mainstream. Why? Because let's face it, these companies aren't going to spend all this money on an ad utilizing a technology that doesn't connect with their audience. It just doesn't make any sense. By the way, we're going to go to a commercial right now, a, a real commercial about augmented reality, but we also take a look at some of the words of the tech that had a huge impact on your business, Facebook, mobile, apps, responsiveness, learning management, great, great stuff out there. Let's get back to a conversation about ads. There's a cool ad on TV. It's about this little girl, about 13, 14. She's bopping around town. She has her iPad. She's doing work. She's having fun. She gets home, and mom asks her, what are you doing with that computer? And her response, precocious as it is, is, what's a computer, right? Well, at the same time that ad comes out, the ad you're about to see comes out. Only though, this one comes out online. It's 15 seconds long, and it's the same girl, yet a different setting. Let's take a look and a listen. Where is it you wanna go? So there she is. And very quickly, in 15 seconds, 15 seconds, Apple has defined what they're going to be working on in the next couple of years, augmented reality. So if you saw the commercial, she had the, lap, the, the iPad, the couch came down next to the park bench. She changed color on it. That can happen out of, out of the blue. This is where we need to be focusing. So commercials like that, huge telltale signs. Lastly, purchases. When we hear about Google buying tools or Amazon buying Whole Foods, you know, these approaches are telltale signs for our industry, that there's a technology that's driving that that we need to be aware of. So you don't ne necessarily want to be an early adopter, but goodness knows, can't afford to be late to the party either, gang. So tech is great, but only if you're using it to tell a great story. And that's the one thing we have to remember. This conversation today is not about technology, even though it's, it's all about technology. What it is about is creativity. Because when we see the technology and we can use it in a way that connects with our customers, that's when that technology comes from something that's just cool to a huge wow factor. So let's go into a couple of categories. We're going to drive just for a few seconds in the mobile social conversation. Now, remember early on, I made a comment that old school hot technologies included your website, your, your desktop traditional website. So the question is really simple. How many times a day do people interact with their phone? Let's get this poll started, and we'll define the conversation really, really well. What I mean by interact is every time that you touch a button on the phone. So if I go to Facebook by clicking on or tapping on Facebook, that's an interaction. By liking a comment, that's an interaction. By posting something, that's an interaction. So you're going to text to 22333. The message will be the six digits, 321955, followed by a space, and followed by that number. How many times a day do people interact with their phones? And it's going to be interesting to see what you say. And you say well, we're not even going to put anything up there. We're not going to talk about anything until we see some numbers come up but we are in the mobile-first approach. In fact, sort of a side note here, if, you're, if your website is in mobile, Google's not going to be giving it a strong consideration. We've got our first number up there, 200, 150. That's a lot of times a day, right? I'm sure some people are going to think it might be lower than that. Some people might think it's higher than that. But again, we're a mobile-first generation right now. Everything we're doing is on that phone. Um, take a look. As these numbers keep coming in, 150 comes in again. So that 150 to 200 number, at least at this point, seems to be the top end of how many times we're interacting. Okay, got that? Let's look. These numbers can be staggering. Number one, average daily touches. Average, the average person, 2,617. And these numbers were from almost a year and a half ago. The heavy users interact over five thousand times. And in fact, those 2,600 touches come into 76 separate phone sessions. That's 76 times. You pick up your phone, you do something, put it back down. 76 sessions, 12 hours in a day, six sessions an hour. Maybe we're on there five, six, seven. When, when do we have time to do anything else? 
And that really is the question. We're always on our phone, which is why when you think about your strategies as a planner, as a supplier, trying to sell, trying to market your events, trying to provide content that's real-time ready, it has to be mobile first. By the way, if we have those touches, Facebook and Google, that tells you something else tells you where your marketing efforts need to be spent. If I look at some of the industry conferences right now, every time I go into Facebook, I'm seeing sponsored ads and boosted posts from them. Pretty standard stuff these days. These numbers tell us one clear thing. Every decision we make about technology, every decision we make about our conference, and every decision we make about our facility has to be with a mobile-first mindset in mind. Now, on the social side, just a couple of questions. I'm going to throw all three of these up on the screen just so you can see them right now. But three things, because we're not talking about whether you should use Instagram or Twitter. Of course you should. But are you using, I mean, are you boosting social posts as a marketing tool? Are you using filters and geo filters, the ability to actually focus content in a specific area to effectively curate? And are you using paid influencers for marketing and promotion? I know some folks in this industry we swear that's the most important question that we're going to ask in this social strata here. But the question about social isn't any more should I use it or which one. It's how successfully I can navigate the social landscape because we know everyone's there and we know they're all there on their phone. Curation, always a critical tool. Great way to use social effectively. I'm a big, big fan of the Flipboard app to get my content and then socially share it onto Facebook with a single touch. I'm also a huge believer, and we'll showcase it here, uh, with an app, or I should say, a uh, website called Paper.ly. And this allows me to take my content through Twitter as well as through Facebook and through specific hashtags and create a daily newspaper so that my constituents can have that data. I do mine these days on cybersecurity because it's something I'm thinking about and talking about a lot these days. So I, I use the paper to feed my own information, to allow myself to curate effectively. So the mobile social isn't going away. We're talking about it as it's old school, but its focus is going to be a tool to support the other technologies that are moving forward. So let's talk about some of those. Let's talk mixed reality. And in fact, when conversations come up about augmented and virtual, the first thing I hear is, you know, it's for kids, it's for gamers, it's for certain types of businesses, but certainly it's not for the hospitality industry where we, what, I mean, these things can't support what we do or, or, or can they? A couple of definitions, because people times often confuse the two. Virtual reality, great picture of me with the glasses on a couple of years ago, 360 immersive world. And in fact, if you remember one word about this definition, it's the word immersive. Because when you have those goggles on, you can't see anything else. You're just seeing the experience that's in there. And it's a, it really is an amazing experience, although we'll talk in a second about 360 and VR, that there is a second type of 360 content that isn't glasses-based. But for basic definition, when you hear someone saying virtual reality, you got the goggles on, and you're clueless what else is out there. Augmented reality, different story. It's not visible to the naked eye but it can be seen through the phone or a tablet, ultimately through a wearable, where stuff will just pop up. You know, you saw the movie many years ago, Minority Report, with Tom Cruise, you have all the information that's sort of floating over someone's head. You know, I look at that and I go, well, that's the future of a conference. With, you know, you're not going to have a badge, but right over your head will be your name. It'll connect with the person you're walking towards. It'll let you know where you met them or maybe how you're connected with them on social media. It might be able to use artificial intelligence to be able to connect a couple of things that you both have in common, why you're attending the conference. Again, conversation is not about technology, about how we're going to be using it. So VR, AR, these are the definitions that are there. Now, with 360, with virtual reality, a lot of people think that it's not really applicable to such a social industry such as ours because you are in, on an island, as it were. Although there are apps out there, one, one of them is called Allspace, that allow you to share experiences in VR with other people. I think we're still a few years from a larger scale adoption to that. But there is VR, or I should say 360, that is web-based, web VR. Uh, it's a cool tool out there called Explorator, a company that's doing great 360 walkthroughs of spaces. 
They have a fantastic Santa Clara virtual tour on their website that allows you literally to walk through that city and a number of others to be able to see from your desktop in 360 how cool that is and how much you can actually take a look at any type of scenario, any facility. In fact, I guess the suppliers, all the suppliers who are here, I can't imagine any one of you not going to a traditional trade show or going to a client's office without VR goggles and without some sort of layout of your space, perhaps customized to your client's content and needs so that you can show them with the wow factor that a virtual reality tour can give to allow people to experience it more than just by seeing a picture or two. And we all know that you know, site inspections are tough to do. You know, there's a time issue, there's money issues there, but to be able to see stuff in VR and get that real experiential approach is going to be a game changer in what we do. You can do re recording in 360 at little to no cost. In fact, at the bottom, Google has an app called Cardboard Camera. You can download it right now and do basic 360 pictures, static pictures, but at least give you a great workaround. Samsung, GoPro have under $1,000 cameras that are going to shoot in, in, in 4K video. So, you know, it's certainly doable, at least to start with, at a very affordable level. Now, AR is different augmented reality, the ability you can turn something into something else. I'm going to try to show you a video right now. It's a label of this wine, and the wine is called 19 Crimes. And if you're ever in the wine store, and I know nobody in our industry ever goes to a wine store, but if you're ever in there and you see that wine, you see any of those labels, and you download the Living Wine Labels app, now let's take a look. You might not actually hear it well, but take a look at this, because I recorded this you see coming over is the phone, and the label comes to life, and she starts talking and telling her story, all by just putting the phone over an image that is augmented reality ready. Pretty phenomenal stuff. We, I've seen it. I, 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 go, I went out to the Space Needle in Seattle about a year or two ago, and they have these huge spots that if you have the app, you can hover over that and the space needle comes to life. I've seen event planners use augmented reality to be able to take the promo ad or poster of the conference and layer a video right on top of that. I mean, how cool is that? And matter of fact, some of the stuff they can do for, for, for $5. The, the price isn't that high. Now, the problem with augmented reality is not doing it. And I was down in Huntsville, Alabama, about a year, year plus ago, and they had these spots the same way that the folks in Seattle at the Space Needle have them of all the Apollo missions. And I go, that's cool. I remember as a kid watching that stuff. So I take my phone out and look for the app and realize um, there isn't one. And all they were were spots on the ground. You see, we're such a mobile-first society that we're now looking for ways to engage with those particular devices. So I've seen trade shows, whether it's traditional or the the one-on-one the -on -one conversations, and there might be these spots on the ground that are three feet by three feet or two feet by two feet with a picture of the destination. Why not make that come to life? Why not help your guests, your clients engage with that technology? That was a huge, huge conversation about AR versus VR that Apple is in the middle of. Because Apple is all in on AR, whereas you talk to companies like Samsung, they're very much all in on VR, Google playing both spaces. Now, to create augmented reality, there are tools, three on the board right here, War on the far left, HP Reveal in the center, Layer in the right, and let's just take a look. Let's just go over to the Layer site. I was just doing a talk at the Connect New York conference a few days ago, and it was sponsored by Visit Salt Lake. And so what we did was we took their logo and we just literally took a YouTube video and layered it right on top of that logo. So if you were, and it's still available now, if you were to download the Layer app, which is free of charge, and go over the Salt Lake logo, that video for this summer's Connect conference would appear instantaneously. How long did it take me to do that? Three minutes. The price? Three dollars. No reason not to, really no reason not to play in that space. So we talked AR, we talked VR. 
Now we're talking artificial intelligence and bots. And, and I'll give you 20 seconds to read that quote. Okay, I gave it less than 20 seconds, so you get the idea. We create so much data today. The question isn't a matter of the data that's out there. It's how we're using it. How are we using as planners the information that we're finding out about our clients? Now, there is a way cool, way creepy scale that plays in there that if we start getting too close and using too much information, our attendees might go, well, that, that, that's too much information they know about me. But the bottom line is, what are you doing with this AI information that you have? Anything? Now, we're using it every day. Again, this is not something that's in the early adopter stage. In fact, if you're on Amazon, if you're on Netflix, all of those, you know, people who like Game of Thrones also enjoyed. That's all artificial intelligence. We're, we're doing that all the time. In fact, if you have a Google Home or an Amazon Echo, all of those chatbots are using incredible artificial intelligence. We'll talk a bit more excuse me, about that in a second, but they're all AI-based. In fact, Google is all over this. Google Translate, they purchased six years ago now, maybe it was five years ago, a product called WordLens. Remember, we talked about when you, when you see a purchase, you hear about a purchase in technology, you better be paying attention to it. Well, they bought this WordLens app that could translate, get this, five languages in real time, and right now it can translate over 120. But the real cool thing in the past couple of months is they've released their earphones, their Pixel Buds, that when connected with Translate, will take the language of the person that's speaking to you and will translate it in your ear to your native tongue. How cool is that artificial intelligence use? So we talked for a second about the Amazon Echo and the Google Home. Did you know, because the question up there is rhetorical, that you can build apps for your organization and do so with a modicum of knowledge about programming and coding. Um, Amazon Echo has the blueprint. Um, Google Home has something called the Actions Console. You can create quizzes. You can create game shows. You can create inter interesting facts. You can really extend that conversation that you're having right to the home unit of your customers and clients. It's all about voice. That's one thing we have to take away from this, that as we moved away from the desktop and into mobile, it's also moving away from the hands-on keypads to everything being voice and gesture based. Uh, if we had time, we'd show a really cool video, but we can get a chance. If you haven't heard about what Amazon did in Seattle last year, which is put out in a store that is entirely artificial intelligence based, it's called Amazon Go, where you go to the supermarket, you scan your app on your phone as you walk in there, and you never have to see someone again because you walk around, you take what you want, you leave when you want, no checkout. All of that is done instantaneously. And I see that and I look at that and I'm thinking, I go, you know what? That's going to transform how we handle registration, how hotels handle it, how meeting planners handle it. Clearly, our industry, our industry is going to be able to use Go technology so effectively to be able to get rid of those long lines at registration. Now, I was, a, I was a science and medical planner for 20 years, and I remember the first day of the conference, we'd have 5,000 people, and it would seem 4,900 of them were registering at the same time. But once we have this type of technology, which, quite frankly, is, is here today, we could be able to have their phone get scanned as they walk in, immediately register, get their payment, all done. Disruption. That first poll we did, cool and interesting and never-ending, Disruptive might really have been the proper answer there. And, oh, yeah, have you met Amy? Amy's my personal assistant, but eh, she's not real. She's a bot. And what that means is that if someone out there, maybe Camille, who's with Connect and I, were trying to hook up on a date to meet, you know, have a phone conversation, you know, the game of back and forth in email that goes on that takes all day long. Well, instead, I send a note to Camille and I copy Amy. And what Amy would do, and remember, she's not real. She's AI. And she would write a perfectly constructed note to Camille offering dates that I was available and times that we could talk. She has connection to my calendar. Camille will interact with her not even knowing that she's not a real person. And then Amy gives me a note at the end, tells me how many different uh, meetings she's been able to plan for me and how to use her services better. Chatbots, artificial intelligence being able to offload some of the redundant tasks that we do. In fact, our industry, and yeah, it's 
probably getting a little bit right creepy. I, I got that. But work with me on this one for a second. Because the chatbots, these tools, not only can be done through an interface like Amy, and by the way, that is x.ai website, but it can be embedded into your website or your app to allow your customers and your constituents to be able to access information, to get those basic questions you're asked again and again and again, but to be able to be, have that happen automated. In fact, our industry has a couple of chatbots already out there. Concierge, Eventbot, the company, Sciencio, has a really, really cool chatbot. And if you go on to Facebook Messenger, which obviously has over 100,000 chatbots here, you can actually assist with different things. So I'm going to interface with her right now. I'm going to talk about the menu. I can, she can tell me the events being held on June 19th. I want to find about the agenda. I can just click right there. I can ask a question. And all of a sudden, the bot will come up with information. So there we go. At 9 o'clock, meet for breakfast. At 10 o'clock, line messaging. And not a person is there, yet the customer is getting the content. Remember, 100,000 100, chatbots on Facebook alone, and our industry with great work by companies like Ciencio is doing this um, and having this available to us. you got to be thinking about it. Wearables and beyond, my hero, Dick Tracy, speaking into a phone when I was a kid, I thought that would never happen. But right now, it's, it, it's every day, right? So obviously, that killer app, the Fitbits, cool. Some people like it, some people don't. Google Glass wearable technology, if you even look at a tool like a Myo, M-Y-O, which you're allowed to put, you put around your arm and using muscle movement will actually advance your slides automatically without any sort of a dancer in your hand, all sort of cool stuff that's out there. So your phone really doesn't be the, the, the interface that you're holding physically. It becomes the interface. It's sort of like your personal server. That's how I see your phones in the next couple of years, and I do believe that both Apple and Android are sort of getting ready for that day where the phone is nothing more than an extension of the wearables that they're going to be delivering. And this year, an Indiegogo exclusive was a company called Orbi Prime, glasses that do 360 video recording. Yeah, yeah, I know, really creepy, but you can be sure I'm going to be getting one once it comes out. And so as we're finishing this up, what about other technologies? What about drones and your conference? You know, I know there's still a lot of FAA regulations about them, but uh, people who have done outdoor events say they're using them incredibly successfully for great candid photography. The whole concept of the IoT, the Internet of Things, the fact that everything is going to have connectivity, chairs, tables, equipment, you'll all be able to be tracked and followed. And you, you have IoT right now in your house if you have a Nest thermometer or if you have Amazon Ring doorbell. Any of that stuff is all connected through this whole, whole uh, huge interaction of technology that's out there. What is GDPR? We're going to have to spend at least 30 seconds on this because if you have even one customer in your database from the European Union, you have to understand that on May 25th, they now have the ability to take all their information back. And if you don't oblige, you're going to be liable for enormous fines. In fact, the first fine is 4% of your total gross revenue of your organization. What is the data that they, they can ask for control of? Anything. Name, address, photos, emails, social posts. And any organization doing business with someone from the EU will be responsible for compliance. So it's not just European countries. If we do international meetings, we certainly have people in the EU and we better be paying attention to it. What you really have to do in terms of your collection of data is make sure your organization is aware of the compliance factor. And in fact, we're talking about only a few weeks away when this comes in. It'll be really interesting to see what happens. And the blockchain. What about the blockchain? Well, I'm not sure how and when that's going to take flight, but clearly a contract that is secure, that is in this online ledger, that is enforceable only when both, party meet, both, both parties meet their conditions. It's a clear, clear way that the blockchain might encroach in our industry. I was just reading yesterday about how real estate is using the blockchain technology right now to try to level up the playing field for the, for the purchase of a home. And then you got autonomous cars. So I've got a question for you. I mean, I'm just going to ask it and I want you to think about it. Maybe when we have Q&A at the end, you can come back with what your thoughts are. 
but would you use an autonomous shuttle for your event right now? Um, and if you wouldn't, would you use it if you got a really, really big discount? Um, I know a lot of people are saying, well, especially with what happened in Phoenix a month or two ago, um, that I'm not going to use that. It's still dangerous. And I, I agree, there are still flaws in it. But quite frankly, that situation in Phoenix shouldn't have happened, and there was a human being in there. So not only did the AI not work, but the human being didn't work either. And that's really a sad thing to say, but autonomous vehicles, it's not going away. So if they offered a huge discount to your bottom line, make you think about it, doesn't it? So speaking of autonomous cars, what about autonomous flying taxis? Yeah, you think, nah, that's not going to happen. But guess what? Here, already being tested out in Dubai right now. Pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, it's creepy too. I, 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 I get that. So as we end this session and we bring it back to Camille and we get to answer some questions, what I want you thinking about is the one idea you can take away from a really quick high-end, high-pushing of information webinar to improve your events with technology. It could be just thinking mobile first. It might be augmented and virtual, artificial intelligence, chatbots. It could be something else that just struck your mind based on what we've talked about. But the more we're open to moving even slowly with the embracing and adoption of technology in our events, the more we're going to stay relevant as time moves on. You guys, as always, are awesome. Camille, I'm going to hand it back to you. Hopefully we have some questions and we can make sure that people get their technology questions answered right now. Thanks, Ben. Camille? Thanks, Jim. Yes, the floor is open. If anyone has any questions they want to ask or to have something further explain that Jim can tell. You know, one of the things, Camille, that was really, really interesting about that X.ai, and I did see that you posted on the chat, is that the price point you would think for artificial intelligence is outrageously high, yet they're providing that service for somewhere around $20 a month. You know, so the, the secondary conversation that goes on with all the technology is will it replace what we do as planners? And that's a heck of a conversation. Personally, I don't think it's going to replace what we do, I do think it's going to change what we do. And I do think we're going to be able to offload a lot of the redundancy type tasks and be able to be more creative types within the context of our, of our industry. Do you tend to agree with that, Camille? Yeah, I do. I think um, we'll have more free time to focus on things that probably require, like you said, more creativity um, as opposed to doing so many repetitive things um, that take up time that you don't need, that doesn't need to take up so much yep. time. Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing that all that stuff can actually offload and save us so much more of, of the time that is clearly at a premium for us these days. Yeah, and I really enjoyed that video you had um, with the lady on the wine bottle. I've never seen anything like that before. No. Oh, my goodness. And it will make you just want to go into a wine store right now and search out that bottle. But they have like six or seven different labels, and they all have different animation that pops up. I mean, if you did a, a basic search on, on AR, on augmented reality, you're going to find so much that's out there. I and mean, when we were just doing the Connect New York City, we showcased 10 different augmented reality apps that people could download right now, you know, from – Space Needle coming to life because obviously that's something that I've, I've seen myself to poster videos coming up to dollar bills turning into stories about the White House. Um, just phenomenal. In fact, more and more of what's happening within the Apple infrastructure is all based on giving developers the ability to build an augmented reality. And I have seen some of our apps in our industry start to incorporate AR functionality as part of their tool chest, which is a great thing. Yeah, and I think the more that people use it and it becomes readily available, it will be easier, too, um, mm -hmm. to use as well because it will be more mainstream. I think that's a problem that a lot of folks have. They wait for that first killer app before they take the leap. And AR had it. AR had it a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, when Pokemon Go came out, and I know a lot of people hated it and people were walking into walls and not paying attention to what they were doing, but 4 million downloads later, you got to realize that all of a sudden AR went from something that was cool to something that was in an awful lot of people's hands. And as we kept saying, every time I see a mass number of people using, the, using a technology like that, I'm really thinking 
that's something we have to be thinking about how we can embrace it in our in our own events. Yeah, definitely. That's true. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jim at all before we wrap it up? No, I'm happy to send the PowerPoint to anybody who wants you to just send me a note um, if you want to have that because just sometimes you have to look at the stuff two and three times before you go, oh, yeah, that's what that was about. Yes, and the follow-up email will include Jim's email address for anyone who wants to reach out to him with any further questions at all. And if we don't have any questions, I'm going to thank you again, Jim, for sharing it with us today. It's very informative. I've learned a lot, I know. And after this webinar concludes, I, it will be, you'll be, you will be directed to a short survey, and if you could fill that out, that would be great for us to get some feedback. You can learn about Connect past and upcoming webinars on all of our websites listed on your screen now. There we go. And for those of you watching live today, the CMP credit is pending approval from the EIC, but once the credit is approved, we will email you a certificate of attendance. And again, if you're watching on demand, please email me um, directly as your certificate will not come. If you have any questions, you can email me at cmore at connecttravel.com. And we hope you'll join us again on June 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another informative session with Connect speaker John Now. All right, and let me type in my email address for anyone. All right, everyone, thank you again and have a good day.